Wind, which comes flying. <laughs> Bird flu. <laughs> right. Um, it feels, it, it seems clear that um, we are being set up uh, for an, another, another attempt, another run, uh, including uh, a rollout of what is likely to be mRNA platform vaccines uh, to deal with what we are being told is going to be the next pandemic. Right. And I think actually you're, 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 you're wise to phrase it that way. We are making headway against pieces of something that we cannot fully make heads or tails of. So, yes, we want a major victory against the World Health Organization and the rules that it wished to live the next um, catastrophe under rules that put it at an unbearable advantage over sovereign nations and people. Um, but other parts of the plan appear to be proceeding uh, apace. An article saying that scientists are developing mRNA-based vaccines against H5N1 bird flu, and then scroll down a little bit. Um, oh, so, okay, an experimental mRNA vaccine against the H5N1 avian flu is highly effective in preventing severe illness and death in lab animals, researchers report. The vaccine could help fight the H5N1 bird flu outbreak now spreading in wild birds, poultry, and cows in the United States. Yada, yada, yada. Okay, so what we know is that the mRNA platform is a dream come true from a pharma business perspective, the ability to effectively load in any antigen in mRNA description into this platform and deploy it almost immediately. It's fast and there's no thinking required. It's fast and there's no thinking required. Um, on the other hand, uh, it is massively dangerous by virtue of the fact that the lipid nanoparticles used to deliver the, um, the mRNA template are in no way targeted. And if they cannot be restricted, therefore, to the injection site, they place all of the tissues of the body in jeopardy of an attack from your own immune cells. So why are they playing around with this mRNA platform that they have not solved the problems of for avian flu? What's more, the whole avian flu story appears to be uh, an exercise in curiouser and curiouser. The more you look at what is being claimed as is taking place, the more this doesn't smell right. McCullough and his colleagues are arguing is that the avian flu that is being found in uh, domestic birds, in farm birds, uh, shows the signs of having been the result of a laboratory origin, that in fact, that it appears to have been enhanced. Mm -hmm. And I do not know whether or not we are facing a setup. Yeah. Could be that something has leaked and we are facing a rerun of COVID. If in fact COVID was an accidental leak, um, or it could be that there is something else afoot in which somebody wishes to have um, power over us. And mm -hmm. it has found that fear of pathogenic disease is very effective. Um, now, there are interesting things um, in both McCullough and colleagues' description here and in the announcement by the World Health Organization of what this is and why we should be worried about it. Mm -hmm. This is the WHO saying, almost all cases of H5N1 virus infection of people have been associated with close contact with infected live or dead birds or H5N1 contaminated environments, for example, live bird markets. There have been some instances of spread from infected mammals to humans as well. While there may have been some cases that were not detected, the virus does not seem to easily infect humans or spread from person to person based on the current knowledge and understanding. Okay. Now, to the extent that somebody wants us to be spooked, by H5N1. The fact that it does not, is not known to spread between people tells us a lot about where we are evolutionarily. Oh my goodness, there might be a human pandemic of H5N1. Right. Well, so far, 
what we've got is a virus that moves from animals to people. You're not in danger of getting it because somebody else who works in a chicken farm has right. come down with it. They can't transmit it to you. Right. So that means that this this is in the same state as the virus in Yunnan province yes. that the world that the uh, the Wuhan Institute of Virology went pursuing mm -hmm. when six miners came down with a disease after uh, working in a mine clearing bat guano. Okay, so six miners came down with a disease. Three of them died. Um, it was not a disease at that point that appeared capable of moving from one person to another. They infected nobody, but that seems to have alerted people who are interested in enhancing viruses that there was a virus in Yunnan that knew one of the two tricks necessary to turn it into a human pandemic, right? The two tricks are, can you infect a human and can you move from one person to another? So they had a virus that did one of those things and they got very excited about that and they went looking, right? So that I'm building, I'm putting together the story as we now and understand it. Mm -hmm. um, it took a long time to understand what the relationship between uh, that Yunnan uh, set of miners and uh, the Wuhan Inter Institute of Virology is. Mm -hmm. But this H5N1 here appears not to be a virus that people can transmit to each other. It's a virus that people appear to be able to contract from uh, animals that they are in contact with. Um, now, McCullough and his colleagues, I won't say McCullough at all because he's the last author, not the first. Yeah, it's all such. Um, but they uh, describe a number of features of the uh, current outbreak of H5N1 that are worthy of consideration. They're, the reason that they are calling attention to the possibility that this emerged from a laboratory is that they find a number of things which will sounds shockingly reminiscent of what we went through with SARS-CoV-2. So, uh, and in some ways, I would argue that the evolutionary story, if we try to infer it, suggests that panic is not the right response here by far. Mm -hmm. We've got a virus that shows a huge um, range of possible uh I don't want to say vectors because we don't know if, if they transmit it, but a large number of creatures appear to be able to be infected um, by this H5N1. Um, yeah, actually, this this is a place I want to go. Um, it's on my screen here um, from the WHO, right? Yep. Um, since 2022, there have been increasing reports of deadly outbreaks among mammals also caused by influenza. H5, including influenza A, H5N1 viruses. They are likely to be more outbreaks that have not been detected or reported. Both land and sea mammals have been affected, including outbreaks in farmed fur animals, seals, sea lions, and detections in other wild and domestic animals such as foxes, bears, otters, raccoons, cats, dogs, coes, coes, cows, goats, and others. Um, <clears throat> my reaction reading that list was, how do they know? Like what they, that how they they know that this virus is in sea lions? Like what what is that work that is being done? And um and uh when I s when I look at the link that uh, I think it's Holscher sorry, I'm butchering his name at all, the the McCullough paper uh, with two other co authors, um links to with regard to evidence of this virus in a terciops, a, a bottlenose dolphin, um, I find some i find a lot of stuff that seems science-ish right and that has all of the pieces um but here you know here we are in this paper uh, here's the, the top of it highly pathogenic avian influenza h5n1 virus in a common bottlenose dolphin in florida this is published just recently april 18 2024 um and here's just, just slightly farther down um the recent spread of uh, H5N1 viruses has been accompanied by novel infections of cetaceous species, cetacean species around the world, including three common dolphins in Peru, Wales, and England, two harbor porpoises in Sweden and England, and an Atlantic white-side dolphin um, in the harbor porpoise from Sweden. Influenza virus was predominantly found within the brain, causing meningoencephalitis, consistent within, with this current report and other recent detections in terrestrial mammals. The harbor porpoise displayed neurological signs, including circling, inability to right itself, and subsequent drowning. So part of the answer is these are captive animals, 
this doesn't explain the seals and sea lions. These are captive animals, right? These are all, that's how they know because they had animals that became sick and then they went looking. But what they have done feels very much to me like the um, bait and switch trick that Forrest Moretti writes about with regard to um, polio. And I don't know, like we don't know, but the fact that meningoencephalitis shows up here as um, as the thing that is that that was the apparent disease for which they then went looking for the cause, and they found H five N one in these animals and went, aha, that must be the cause. I want to see the actual research that ties that virus, the presence of that virus, to this cause. Yep. And maybe it exists. I don't have a hope either way, but. I don't see any evidence that that relationship between cause and effect has been made. They just went, oh my God, bad problem happening to our animal. Oh, we know that there's this circulating thing about which we've been told to be uh, concerned. And hey, presto, magic, like we have a test for it. We went looking and yes, they have this, they have this virus. So I don't know if there's a relationship. Right. The, the claim is embedded in the thinking so much uh, that we aren't even we aren't even expected to notice that there was a, a, a magic trick there. And it raises questions, as with Forrest Moretti's work on polio, um, what's it doing in the brain? You and I have learned painfully, yeah. uh, starting with the discovery of just how bad the safety testing was for the covid so-called vaccines. Um, that one of the tricks that pharma has played for other vaccines is to not test them against a placebo. What they do is, through some logical hocus pocus, they argue that in fact all you want to do is test the novel part of the so-called, or in this case, real vaccine right. against um, uh, a version that contains all of the other components but for that one part. So, for example... Um, you could leave the adjuvants uh, as components in both the so-called placebo group and the treatment group, and you could just change the subject matter of the vaccine, the antigenic component. Now, that, what that does... As if the adjuvants were neutral when they are included precisely because they are not neutral. Precisely because they are bioactive. Right. So the point is you hide the harm by making sure it shows up in both the placebo and the treatment group. And then when people say, well, it was tested against placebo, placebo doesn't mean placebo in that case. Yeah, again, right? again, with the linguistic shenanigans. Yeah, placebo implies to most of us when we are naive, it implies uh, neutral, right? It's saline. Right. something like that something that has uh, that is not bioactive but when you have an active component then you hide whatever harm is done by the version you intend to inject in people by having the harm also done to the control group yes so um one thing that makes the mrna platform a wet dream from the point of view of pharma <laughs> is that basically the way it functions is you've got the platform and then the subject matter, which instead of being loaded in as an antigen, is loaded in as a transcript, an mRNA transcript that then gets translated by your body into an antigen. So, you know, you they will make the argument that you don't have to keep testing the platform. All you've got to do is test the new transcript and see whether that has a problem. But if you've been paying attention to Dark Horse, you know... That our argument has been actually the platform itself guarantees your immune system will attack your own cells because it will mistake them as virally infected. Does that matter if they are cells in your liver? Probably not. You can afford to lose a bunch of liver cells and you've got plenty of reserve capacity, spare uh, liver tissue. If it happens in your heart, it could result in you uh, dying uh, as you try to score the winning goal in your soccer game so um, that hazard is part of the platform and if pharma plays its usual game and it says well we've already tested mrna vaccines uh, for safety and they're safe and effective and all we're doing here is adding a different transcript so let's test that transcript well now you're going to have the mrna platform in both the control group and the treatment group they're really both treatment groups in this case, and that will hide all of the harms. Uh, you won't be able to see them. So that's a big hazard with the mRNA thing because uh, they will make the transcript argument. 
Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go quickly because you want to get to one more thing and we actually have to finish yep. very, very quickly here. Um, we are doing a Q&A after this, um, but we got a hard stop not too long in the future. Uh, so the thing that when you said pharma always wins uh, that came to my mind with regard to uh, the introduction of a new mRNA vaccine, which um, will require, as it should, clinical trials, um, <clears throat> is who's going to sign up for clinical trials for a new mRNA vaccine? How many of the people who are signing up for clinical trials for a new mRNA vaccine are themselves unvaccinated with the first mRNA vaccine to hit the planet for COVID, right? Um, I think that number is going to be approaching zero. If if you, despite all of the of the forcing and the shaming and the horrors that were inflicted on those of us who uh, refused to get those mRNA shots for COVID, against COVID, associated with COVID, um, went through all of that, the chances that you're going to willingly sign yourself up for a clinical trial for the next one seems vanishingly small. Um, Thus, assuming that that assumption of mine is correct, uh, the, control, the control group for a new clinical trial for a new mRNA vaccine is ent almost entirely vaccinated with mRNA uh, vaccines already. Technically, therefore, the people running the clinical trial could claim placebo. Like, they, they could actually potentially um, use placebos, although I doubt that they actually are. You mean exactly. inert placebo? Inert, an, an actual placebo, like uh, placebo as it used to mean, as opposed to what it is being used to mean now, inert placebos, yes. Um, they could actually run a clinical trial with inert placebos, um, but having already run their test on humanity not three years ago, uh, in which the people who were signing up for this trial almost certainly got, you know, at least two and maybe up to God knows how many um, of these mRNA shots, um, there are relatively few actual controls possible. And so, given that we are now seeing even the Telegraph reporting, that is to say, even the mainstream media reporting on excess deaths uh, in 2021 that exceed excess deaths from 2020, which suggests, you know, what was different between 2021 and 2020? Well, both had COVID, but only one had these vaccines. One had these mRNA vaccines. Um, given that we have excess deaths in a population um, that is is vaccinated in excess of the excess deaths in a population that only has the pathogen and not the not the vaccination. There is no unvaccinated control in these clinical trials, almost certainly. So, whatever additional effects these new mRNA vaccines may have is going to be dampened in terms of the clinical results because you're comparing it to a population that has already experienced mRNA vaccination from the previous disease. Which is interesting because it is an inversion of a well-known bias that has previously been seen with other vaccines, something called the healthy vaccine uh, bias. So right. the, the problem is that right. people who get vaccines tend to be health-wise proactive. So the question is, how much does that appear to be a positive effect of a vaccine when in fact it's a... Well, if proactive means following the Pied Piper, it's not going to help. Right. Well, in this case, you would expect a, uh, a healthy non-vaccine bias exactly. or a a vaccine sickness bias and that's that's the inversion of the normal expected pattern yeah anecdotally um i will say that we talked to yet another person yesterday and i have not been keeping track um but countless countless people someone who we, we were just coming to know um who said you know i never used to get sick never used to get sick and now every pathogen i run into i get sick and i get sick for longer i'm sick every month and she had three shots yep and you know the anecdotes accumulate they continue to accumulate it's hard to ignore the pattern